Praise God. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. Good morning. Welcome to the house of the Lord. It is a good day to be in the house of the Lord. It's a good day to listen to His Word and to be challenged by His Word. Amen? Amen. I want us to turn to the Scripture straight away. Let's dive straight into the Word of God. Today is Palm Sunday, as Pastor Michael mentioned. It's Palm Sunday. It's a very significant start of the week of Passion Week or Holy Week. It's a week, it's exactly one week before we witness the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the most significant event for a Christian. Without the resurrection, this would be a dead religion. Without the resurrection, you and I are believing in a dead God. But because there is a resurrection, Jesus is alive. And because Jesus is alive, He has the, won the victory for each and every one of us. And you and I have, can stand before His presence because of all that He has done for us. Amen. Amen. So this is the most significant event for us and it's a good time for us to reflect as He journeys to the cross why He did all He did for you and for me. So let's turn to the Scriptures to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. Okay, whether you have it on your phones or if you brought your Bible with you, come on, turn to Matthew chapter 21. It's not going to be on this big screen. Unfortunately, yes. It's not going to be on it. If you don't have a Bible... Share it with a, a, a Bible-believing Christian next to you. Come on. Everybody, if you found Matthew chapter 21, say, I got it. Got it? All right, let's stand to our feet. Let's read Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 11 together. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 to 11. Whatever, whatever version you have, read it and read it with understanding. Don't just go with the... Go with the flow. Don't just rush through because the person next to you is reading faster than you. All right? Read it with understanding. Go through the scriptures together. Okay? One, two, three. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there and her colt by her. And tie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord has need for them. And he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, on a foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The Lord answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word speaks life. Your word is truth. Your word is God breath. And today, I pray in the name of Jesus, help me to preach and teach your word in a way that it will change and transform lives. That people who have come in here, God, they will walk out differently, transformed by the word, the power of the word of God working in their lives. So be with us, help us have open hearts, open minds, and open spirits, oh God, to receive all that you have for us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Amen. What an interesting scenario this is. A prophecy that was spoken 500 over years ago, found in Zechariah 9 verse 9, is finally coming to pass. The king, the Messiah, was going to come as prophesied riding on a donkey. Many of us have heard sermons about the significance of Jesus coming on a donkey, not on a stallion, not on, on a chariot, not on anything grand fit for a king. After all, this was his most significant appearance. This was Jesus' most significant public appearance on earth. But he came riding on a donkey. This is 
why I have entitled my sermon today as The Donkey and Me. The Donkey and Me. Turn to someone and tell them, it's all about me. Come on, tell them, it's all about me. I, I know you are. Some of us are very uncomfortable of saying that, right? How can, how can in church you say it's all about me, you know? It's all about Jesus. Come on, come on, turn to someone and say it's all about me. It is all about me. It's all about you. The very reason why Jesus came was all because of you and for me. It was not for himself. It was for you. It was for me. Jesus does something very different in this part of his story. Unlike when you read all the other accounts of Jesus' travels, he usually travels by foot. He usually goes from one place to another. Or else, or you would read about him going on a boat, traveling to the other side of the sea or the other side of the lake. But in this instance, on his most triumphant entry, most triumphant appearance, public appearance, he asks for a donkey. He asks for a donkey. He knew what was ahead of him. He knew the betrayal. He knew what was coming his way. He knew the crucifixion. He knew the pain and the anguish that he would be facing, yet he did it. He knew it all, yet he still rode into Jerusalem that day. He knew that the crowd that would be shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, would also be the same crowd who would be shouting, Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And just a postscript or a side note, a side dish for some of us here. Don't be surprised when the very people who love you at one moment will want to kill you in the next. It's a very real world. There are some people who celebrate you for a season, celebrate you and love you for a season. But when they have no, when you, when you are of no worth to them, they ditch you. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Yeah? You go through that. So don't be surprised because Jesus himself went through it. Now I want you to notice this. What did the Lord ask the disciples to do? What did the Lord ask the disciples to do? It says here, Jesus sent two of the disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, and her colt. Untie them and bring them to me. He basically tells the disciples, Go on ahead, okay? And, 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 go, and go and take the donkeys. Go and take the donkeys. It's almost like in today's day, to say, Vincent, Kenneth, now, can you please go out? Now, there's a kanjil outside. Uh, just unlock it lah, and then bring it around. Okay, can? Actually, you all both can carry it also. Lah. You can carry the kanchil here for me. What a preposterous thing to do. The, the, the disciples must be wondering, maybe, maybe ministry stress, lah, this Jesus. Something is not very right. He's asking us to go in there and just find the donkey and bring it in. You know, it's not even our donkey. It's not even his donkey. It's not, you know, and, and what, what would the owners say? What would they, the people around us will be accusing us? And Jesus knew exactly what they were thinking. Jesus knew what they were thinking. So what, did, what was Jesus' answer to them? In verse 3, he says, If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord... Hello? It's in the scripture. Verse 3, if anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them. Tell them that the Lord needs them. All right, let's pause for a moment here. Let's think about this statement for a bit. The Lord needs them. What? Possibly, could Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides for all my needs, El Shaddai, the more than enough, the all-sufficient one, have need for? Doesn't he, he has everything. Doesn't El Shaddai, can't El Shaddai provide everything that he needs for himself? The Lord needs them. The Lord 
needs them. What we need to understand here is this. The donkey and the colt already belong to him. The car that you drive already belongs to him. The house that you have is, is his. The shirt on your back, the shoes that you wear, the business that you own, even your children, they belong to him. They belong to him. The Bible says in Psalms 24 verse 1, it says, The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Everything is His. He owns everything, but He puts us as stewards over the resources. God owns it all, but He placed things in our hands. Hasn't it been how the Lord has worked all this while? When He provides for His people, He provides for His work. Amen? Oh, it gets very quiet here. Everybody's, no, it's mine. It's mine. How can I work hard for it, you know? When the Lord provides for His people, the Lord provides for His work. Amen? Amen? The word here is this. The word need in the Greek is the word kreia. The word need in the Greek is kreia, which means employment, business, and use. The Lord has business for this donkey. The Lord had use for this donkey. The Lord had employment for this donkey. He has use for it. And it's because of being, and that's a, it's about being in partnership with Him. When He needs it, you have a choice whether to release that resource or to keep it for yourself, whether you will hoard it or extend it. So today, what is your donkey? What is in your hands? What is in your hands? that you can offer to the Lord. And on that day, he had need and he had business for a donkey. The deliverer came and was going to ride into Jerusalem in his most triumphant moment on a donkey. And I'm so glad he used a donkey. Not just an animal that was perfect, that was a champion, that was strong, but a low-laying, insignificant donkey. God still has use for a donkey. How many of you can say amen to that? God still has use for a donkey. Turn to your neighbor and look at him in the eye and tell him God still has use for you. Yep. Turn to your spouse especially. Turn to them and tell them God still has use for you. Yep. Right? That man, that woman there, he still has use for him or for her. God has still used, God still uses people with donkey issues. Donkey problems. People who are hard-headed, who still want to go their own way. Because God specializes. Oh, He specializes in this. He specializes in using people who are messed up from the chest up. People who are beat up from the feet up. Come on, He still has use for a donkey. Come on, let's give Him the praise for that. He still has use for a donkey. That's why I love Him so much and I praise Him so radically. Because I shouldn't even be here today. So we were singing that song, Hosanna. Tears flowed down. And I said, God, you knew what I would do. You, would, you knew how I would still, how I'm, I'm such a sinner. And yet you went all the way for me. I shouldn't even be standing here preaching to you, but God has brought me a long way, a donkey like me. Some of us have gone our own way and done some things stubbornly and yet, in spite of it all, God still wants to use us. Donkeys were also considered to be unclean animals. In Leviticus chapter 11, it gives us a list of clean and unclean animals. They were considered unclean because of the way they ate their food, the way they chewed their food, and also because of their hooves. The way they walk, it gathered dirt. And some of us in our lives, we've also been like donkeys. Made unclean because of the things that we partook of. Made unclean because of things that we have done. Made unclean because of places we have gone that we shouldn't have gone. But God says He can redeem a donkey for His use. Exodus 13 verse 13 says this, Redeem the donkey by sacrificing a lamb. 
redeem the donkey. Every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. Now, that is a beautiful picture of redemption right there. A beautiful picture of redemption of the Son of God, the Lamb of God, redeeming each and every one of us donkey and telling us that, he, that we are worthy to serve Him because of His redemption. His hands were nailed on the cross. His hands were nailed on the cross for every unclean things, for every, every immoral and impure and filthy things that our hands had done. His feet were bruised and nailed to the cross for every wayward step that we have take, taken away from Him. His very life was shed on the cross so that our sinfulness will be covered by the shadow of the cross. He redeems the unclean for His glory and for His use. And Jesus says, I have business for a donkey. And that was just the introduction. You know, I read this scripture and it just jumped out at me, this first couple of, first couple of verses, because it spoke so much, so much. Don't look at me all holy and all good now and say, I'm no donkey, you know. I, of course, how, how, can pastor say, how can pastor say you can still use a, a donkey and ask me to turn to some? Come on. He puts things in, our, in, in the scripture to teach us lessons, valuable lessons. And unless you and I learn it today, that all we are, all we have, all that we are doing, we're nothing but donkeys in his eyes being used by the Lord. And let us understand a few things about the donkey. Firstly, the, a donkey had to be broken. A donkey had to be broken. For any horse or any donkey to be ridden, it had to be broken in. This was done by trainers and it's a process. If not, the animal will resist. It bucks and jumps because it doesn't like to be ridden. I know some of you, you have read the scriptures and you studied it and you say, but Pastor, this, Pastor, Pastor Gwen, this is a colt. This is a colt, a donkey that has never been ridden. I don't think it's ever been broken. You must understand this. This donkey was not a baby donkey. Just born a few days old, baby donkey, you know, and untie it and bring it. Jesus would not do something like that. He would not come into Jerusalem riding on a baby donkey and risking it to break its back in front of everybody. So it was not a tiny baby donkey. Like, and, and, and it was a donkey that was already probably two or three years old and had been what we call halter broken. Halter broken means they usually already, the trainer has already started putting a halt on the donkey. And then the donkey is already has learned how to be led by a rope walking beside a trainer. It was in the process of being broken. It was in the process of being broken. And nevertheless, Jesus, when he climbed on the donkey, basically Jesus broke the donkey in fully. He calmed the donkey of all its fears. There's a writer who, by the name of Tim Keller, observes that Jesus simply heals the donkey of its fears, making it useful for him. Some of you have gone through seasons of brokenness in your life. You've gone through some stuff that you wish that the earth would open up and swallow you in at that point of time. Some of you have gone through such hard and tough circumstances, so painful, so hurtful, and you're still healing from it many years on. Many don't understand why God allows some things to happen in your life. The breaking always seems hard. Why did, for instance, why did my parents get a divorce? Why did my mother have to die so soon? Why did God give me a baby and take the child away? Why did people have to violate me? Your brokenness is part and process of the process He uses to make you usable for Him. He has business for the broken. He has business for the broken. Doesn't that speak a lot to those of us who are going through tough patches in life? They may not seem to be the likely candidate for Him to use. We don't see them as fit Christ bearers. They are not the, the model Christ bearers that we would to seem, that seem fit, just like the donkey didn't seem fit to be an animal by which the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords should ride in. I'm glad God didn't focus on my failures or my mistakes. He didn't focus on my weakness and my pain. He used them all as tools to break me 
in to knock whatever stubbornness I had out of me, to steer me closer to what He wants me to do to His purpose for my life, to toughen me up for the journey, never to destroy me. God loves you too much to destroy you. He loves you too much to destroy you. Some of us think God has some personal vendetta against us. He doesn't. It's all part and parcel of the process. So that He, but by His sovereignty, He allows things to happen so that He can get to the very core of our lives. Losing my father as a young teenager was a hard and breaking moment. Breaking moments. The days, the months preceding his death, being at the hospital, nursing my father who was supposed to be taking care of me. Those were hard moments. Through life's journey, many things have happened, many episodes, many different things that have happened that have caused that causes a lot of frustration, a lot of fear, a lot of a lot of pain. I'm so glad that God didn't judge me for how I responded in those moments, but He used it for His glory. So don't despise a person going through a season of brokenness or seemingly doesn't look like the right person or candidate for God to make an impact through. God's choices always surprises us. God's choices always surprises us. He always uses the underdogs to be the overcomers. Right? Doesn't he? He always uses the underdogs to be the overcomers. The least of these to be the most of them. How he called his disciples the smelly, fishy, fishy smell, uneducated disciples to be his closest kin and his brothers in ministry. How he called a stammering Moses to lead Israel out from captivity. How he used a prostitute like Rahab. How he used... David, who was the youngest son and a shepherd boy, to be anointed as king. How he used a Christian persecuting Jew to be the most effective and most powerful church planter. People who seem to be least likely to be used. But yet, made it into the hall of faith. The list of the heroes of faith in Hebrews. He specializes in using broken people. Unfit, unqualified, lowly donkeys, just like me. The breaking process is a preparation for you to be a bearer of Christ's presence. Some of you don't even know why you went through some seasons of brokenness and what hit you. In the natural we throw away what's broken, correct? Something's broken, we throw it away. In the natural, we throw away what's broken. But friends, let me say this to you. God places a premium on the broken. God places a premium on the broken. He says, I can use you when you're broken. I can use you when you finally admit you're not quite there. You have, have, may have a broken past, broken family, broken dream, broken promises made by people, broken health, but God is greater than all that. Can somebody say amen? God is greater than all that. In Psalms 51, David, in his lowest moments in his life, he cries out to the Lord. He says, God, a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, you will surely dispose. No, he doesn't say that. He says, a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, you will not despise. He places a premium on the broken. I see some of you here and I know what God has brought you through. The brokenness that He has the seasons of brokenness that God has brought you through to be where you are today. And it's nothing short of saying, God, thank you 
Thank you for breaking me, for making me worthy to be a bearer of your presence. Amen? Secondly, the donkey had to be loosed. The donkey had to be loosed. In order for the master to use the donkey, it had to be untied. It had to be loosed. It says here in verse 2, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, and with her colt, untie them and bring them to me. An animal that is tied up is no use for anyone. It's no use for the master. It's stuck, it's confined, it's limited, it's short-sighted, it's bound. He said, untie them, loose them. Jesus wants to use so many people. He wants to use so many one of us, so many people right here. But so many of us choose not to be unbound, choose to be still allowed, won't allow us themselves to be loose because they are bound by religion, bound by pride, bound by their past, bound by anger, bound by unforgiveness, bound by lust, bound by habits, bound by so many things that still hold us back. God will lose you before He will use you. That's why, friends, that's why the devil wants to keep you bound. That's why the devil wants to keep you bound because he knows the kind of impact you're going to make should you find out what your purpose is. That's why the devil wants to keep you bound because he knows the damage you are going to make to his, to his plans because if you knew and if you were set free. He keeps on reminding you of your past. He keeps on reminding you of the hurt. He keeps, you reminding, keeps on reminding you of the people, what people said, the exact words and how they said it, the tone of how they said it. Stop being bound. He wants to lose you so that he can, he can use you. God wants to lose you, no longer bound by all the things of the past, no longer bound by sin, no longer bound by bondage, no longer bound by, by stuck in some rut, walking in circles. Some of you seated right here, you know you've overcome some serious stuff in your life. You've walked out of fear, you've walked out of lust, you've walked out of a near attempt of adultery, you've walked away from unforgiveness and anger because Jesus found you and He set you free. Because He whom the Son sets free is free. He whom the Son sets free is free. Come on. He set you free. Those of you who say, I found Jesus, I say to you, liar, liar, pants on fire. Jesus was never lost. You were. He found you. He pursued you with His love. He went all out. He sent His Holy Ghost after you and convicted your heart. Some of you, God found you in the prison. Some of you, God found you in the deepest, darkest moments of your life. Some of you, God found you while you're deep into addiction. Some of you, God found you when you were, you were so hurt in your circumstance. God found you. He pursued you with His love. He set you free. He set you free. Come on. Come on. He deserves the glory. He found you and He freed you. You were so bound. If you weren't for the Lord, there was no way you would even be here. When, you were, when you've been set free, you praise differently, you live differently, you serve differently, you give differently, you love differently. The word loose or untie in the Greek, right here, this word untie. The word loose or untie in the Greek is luo. It's a primary verb which means to break, to destroy, to dissolve, to melt, to lose one bound, release from bonds, to set free. Isn't that what God has come to do for us? Why, was the, why did He go all the way to the cross for each and every one of us? So that we will, be, he will, we will be broken from all the chains of the past. He will destroy everything that hurt us, dissolve all the things that have caused us to be so broken in so many ways of our lives. He came. In Luke 4.18, he says this, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed. To set the oppressed. Come on, is there anybody loose in this house? Anybody loose in this house? Give Him the praise. Hallelujah, because I know and I know and I know if it was not because the Lord who has set me free, if it's not the Lord who has set every one of you free, you and I will not be seated right here, right now, praising God in this manner.
Jesus has set you free. Jesus has set you free. Don't live bound by your past. He set you free. He set the donkeys free so that they could do what they were supposed to do. To do what they were purposed to do. To carry the king. God set you free for a purpose. God set you free for a purpose. Amen? Am I preaching over your heads that you don't understand this? Come on. God set you free for a purpose. Amen? Thirdly, the donkey had to be willing. I learned so much from this donkey. Really, I did. As you continue to read and understand this, the donkey had to be willing. What was the, the willingness that had to come from the donkey? The donkey had to be willing to allow the king to sit on his back, carry the king and allow the king to direct his route. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll be where you want me to be. I'll say what you want me to say. I read an article about a person who owns a farm in the UK. And she had some donkeys as well. And she says this about donkeys. She says, donkeys are so stubborn. In the UK, it's a very famous thing apparently to have children rights on donkeys in the seaside. But these donkeys are so stubborn and they're so fixed on their normal path. They're so fixed on their normal path. Listen. They will walk as far as the beach would be and then turn the back around and go back the same way again. No matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you beat them or pull them, they will not change their direction. That was how stubborn they are. That's a lot like us. We like to go our way because it's our routine. Our way of doing things, our way of having things go the way that we have known it to be, known it to be done all these years, all this while, it has to be this way only, and there's no other way. When, when the king comes in into our lives and he changes our direction, that's when we get uncomfortable. We get so uncomfortable when the, when, when the king changes our direction, when the king changes our route, when the king changes our decisions. He prompts us to change it and we're like, no, 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 it cannot be, it cannot be. Because I've always done it this way. Now that's the key. If you want to carry the king, you need to be willing to carry him wherever he wants you to go. You need to be willing to carry the king wherever he wants you to go. This is not just a weekend encounter. You come in here, you sing some songs, you say, Jesus, Messiah, oh, blessed Redeemer, and all that. You start singing and you carry his presence. Because God says you, he inhabits in the praises of his people, right? So you carry his praise, pre presence right here in this weekend. And the moment you leave from this place, the moment the work week starts tomorrow, you push the king off. It doesn't work that way, friends. It doesn't work that way. It is a lifestyle. It is a lifestyle that is willing to allow the king to direct. It's about knowing who you are carrying every day of your life. That donkey must have been the proudest donkey in the world at that point of time. That donkey must have been the proudest donkey at that moment of time. It knew it was carrying the creator of the universe on his back. How do I know that? I mean, if the Bible tells us things like, the rock will cry out if we don't praise him. If an inanimate object can cry out, what more? One that is living and breathing. He knew the moment the king of kings, the creator, his master, his maker, set. On him, he was the proudest donkey ever. He was the proudest and most significant donkey ever. The master, the maker, the El Shaddai, the lily of the valley, the Ferris of 10,000, the rose of Sharon was on his back. If you knew who you were carrying, you won't be walking around 
waking up on Mondays defeated and facing Monday blues. If you knew who you were carrying, you wouldn't be screaming and shouting at the parking lot or at the road when somebody cuts into you. If you knew who you were carrying, you wouldn't be going anywhere and everywhere. You wouldn't be doing things that just because, simply because it makes you happy. Now people tell us things like, I'm unhappy, that's why I want out of this. I'm happy because I have this. Friends, God says, be holy as I am holy. He didn't say, be happy as I am happy. He came not to make us happy. He existed to make us holy. Oh, gets very quiet in the room. Then you say, yo, means uh, God's so bad, man. You know, he, he doesn't care about my happiness. When you are in the center of God's will, doing all that He has directed you, being exactly where He wants you to be, that is the happiest place you can ever be. Amen? Amen? Whose presence do you bear? Do you know who you're carrying every day in your life? Do you know whose presence you're bearing every day of your life? If you only knew that you were carrying the way maker, the life changer, the mountain mover, the body healer, you would be walking with your head held high. The proudest donkey around. The proudest human being around. You are carrying the king in your life. Amen? You are carrying the king every day in your life. The donkey also had to be willing to accept, oh, I like this. The donkey had to be willing to accept that it was all about the king. If it went out the next day, same time, same place, but without the king on its back, there would have been no fanfare, there would have been no palm branches, there would have been no cloaks laid out for him. That donkey was only made significant because of whom he was carrying. Because without the king on its back, it was just another donkey. It was just another smelly, labelled, unclean, filthy, insignificant donkey. When you carry the king, when you do his agenda, guess what? He makes you look good. He makes you look good. But it was never about you. All glory goes to Him. Amen? All glory goes to Him. When you carry Him and carry out your purpose in Him, He will bring you to places. He will promote you. He will make your way and you will make your story known to show the world who He is in you. That's why He uses a donkey, a lowly, insignificant donkey, that nothing to shout about animal to be a bearer of His presence in the crowd. There are just too many believers who want to bear their own image, their own agenda. Too many believers who still think it's all about them. Yes, I started off with that. It's all about them, your own agenda. Too many donkey preachers, too many donkey evangelists who demand for this, who demand for that. Too many donkey worship team members who think it's all about them playing so well. Too many donkey businessmen who think that you achieve what you achieve because you did it. Too many parents who think that you raised your children well because you were clever to navigate through everything in life. When it was all because you had the king covering your back in your life. It was always about who the donkey was carrying, not about the donkey. Not about the donkey. Folks, he's all about making you look good. 
He's all about making you look significant. But know this, John 15, 5 says, Apart from me, you can do nothing. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do... Apart from me, you can do... Come on, I need to get this into you. Apart from me, you can do... Nothing! Apart from the Lord, nothing that you have is significant because you know why? Isaiah 64 verse, 64 verse 6 says this, all, all our efforts, best efforts, is like filthy rags and it amounts to nothing. When you carry the king, you no longer are ordinary people, but you are key players in God's plan to redeem the world. I'm trying to land this plane here, but it's... I want you to know, learn to give Him the glory. Learn to give Him the glory. Whatever achievement, whatever things, whatever success, whatever you have, plenty or little, whatever it is, it is made significant because the King of kings and the Lord of lords is in your life. It is all about the passenger and who the donkey had on its back that day. It was all about Jesus. Never about the donkey. Never about the donkey. Let's pray.